So we are starting the meeting and it looks like we have a very good turnout. Right now it's 290 people. That's, that's much more than we generally get. Okay, the first thing I like to do is to do the uh, officer introductions. Here is our chart. And uh, so we will go around the clock. Uh, this is me, Stephanie Davis, uh, the president. Dave Davis is our West president. And the, the next person is Dave McMillan. Uh, he is the treasurer. And uh, Bob Welke, he is the past president. Um, Ed Sherman, he is the, our secretary and the webinar manager. He's the one sending out the, minute, uh, the meeting announcements and the also uh, update our web website for our information, for our chapter information. Okay, let's go back to the agenda again. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the special interest group. Uh, our uh, West President Dave Davis, he has volunteered to start a new special interest group on investment strategies. And uh, he's planning to start this in September. So in our, our next meeting, uh, he will make some announcements. Uh, next, let's go to the futures meetings. Uh, for year 2023, we still have two more meeting planning planned. The next one is going to be on September 16th. It will be two o'clock in the afternoon. This is going to be an in-person meeting at the Fountain Valley Senior Center. The presentation is going to be AAII Essential Investing Course. Uh, presenter is Ray Rondolf. Ray is the senior technical analyst at the AAII. So far, I have not received any information from Ray yet. Ray say uh, supposed to last week, he's supposed to send out the information, but uh, the way I understand is uh, the uh, promotion in uh, material has to be approved by AAII corporate office. So it looks like there's some the, the, the delay on releasing the information. The only thing I do know is there is some incentives if for, for people who will attend the meeting in person. Okay, that's all I know. But we will put all the information out in our meeting announcements. Okay, so please look, I mean, looking forward to that one. Okay, the next meeting will be November 11th. It will be a Zoom meeting at nine o'clock in the morning. The presentation title is How to Master Cover Call Writing. The presenter is Dr. Alan Elman. Um, El, uh, Dr. Uh, Elman is the president of the Blue Collar Investor Corp. The website is the bluecollarinvestor.com. And uh, I'm still working on the new um uh, speakers for 2024 hopefully next time i can share some information so next thing let's go to the our uh, website uh, aaiorangecounty.com just remember if you have trouble getting to the meeting in the future um check the website because there might be some last minute change or cancellations okay here is the website and uh, has posted all the, all the meetings uh, for the coming meetings. Um, when you click here, you will go to the past meetings. So here is the information for the past meetings. Um, we have posted the videos for the last two meetings for April 22nd and the June uh, 3rd. Uh, those video come very late, okay? So they just posted like two weeks ago. So the presentation slides and video are all there already, okay? Okay, let's go back. Uh, uh, okay, just want to mention that during the presentation, if you have any questions, please tap them in the chat box, okay? And uh, I, the way I understand is Chris would like you to ask the questions at the end of the presentations. 
but if you have some real important question or may need some clarification, uh, please ask them during the presentation. Today's speaker is Chris Patterson, best in class fund selection and behavior. Okay, I'm going to stop the share so Chris, you can put up your slides while I'm making the introduction, okay? Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Chris Patterson. Chris is Director of Research at the Merriman Financial Education Foundation and the creator of the Two Funds for Life, investing approach to augmenting target day funds. He is an engineer by training and a new opportunity finder by nature. In his work for the foundation, he develops and maintains a set of best-in-class exchange traded fund ETF recommendations. The customizable Merriman aggressive target date glide pass calculator and regularly contributes to articles and podcasts. Like the rest of Merriman Foundation staff, his work is motivated by a genuine desire to learn and help, free of any financial incentives or conflict of interest. Chris, the floor is all yours now. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, and just to follow up, you know, on the comment about questions, if anybody feels like I have uh, made a, a leap that's hard to follow while we're talking, uh, I type it in in all caps or something in the chat session and we'll pause and I'll try to fill in that gap because sometimes I, I do that and I definitely don't want to. I'd like to keep keep everybody with us as we're going. Uh, but uh, I, I do think uh, it's hard to be interactive in these things on Zoom calls as much as I would like it to be. And so I'm going to mostly just kind of plow through and present, and then we'll have a good chunk of time for questions at the end. And I am super excited. I am super excited about today's topic because uh, it's the first time we've really combined the three things that matter a lot to investors, the topic of meaningful diversification, the topic of uh, investor behavior, and the topic of fund selection. All three of those things are necessary, and I think it's gonna be a fun presentation, and hopefully we'll have some really fun questions. So I thought I would start, because I just traveled to Iceland um, with a couple of out of category things. Um, Iceland was beautiful, and as I was traveling there, um, since I'm a financial educator, I couldn't help but looking at the natural beauty and think about investing. So one of the really key questions for investors is what kind of an investor are you? And uh, I'd like to actually I go back here. Um, I'd like to start by showing you a bird. This is the northern fulmar. And it's an incredibly graceful bird, and it does this thing that you see it doing right here. It sails just fractions of an inch above the water, and it, it makes its living pretty much right there at the edge of the water. Uh, it lives by being a scavenger and finding food on top of the water, on the land, or just a foot or two below the water. Very, very graceful bird. And then the second animal I want you to look at is a little bit different. This is a Northern Atlantic puffin. Uh, I've heard them described as baseballs with wings. I mean, they really are not very aerodynamic. When you see them fly, you kind of wonder if, if nature intended them to be able to fly. They can fly for hundreds of miles. So they are kind of amazing in that respect, as hard as it is. But the reason they're not such graceful flyers is that their wings are tuned for something else. Their wings are tuned for swimming. So these birds, rather than living at the surface, can dive deep. They can dive 100 feet, 200 feet, and uh, fish, and, and get what the bird at the surface can't get. And then they have these special bills that let them hold on to fish while they hunt for more fish, and they can come back with a dozen fish at a time. They're, they're just incredible creatures. 
So the reason I thought it was interesting to start with that is that these are very different and investors are very different. <laughs> and as we'll see as we go through this presentation, uh, you, you have a choice. You have a big choice about what kind of an investor you want to be. Now, investing is personal. Personal investing and, and the kind of education we try to do for personal investors usually ends up pretty quickly coming to this fork in the road. People come to us and they ask us, you know, very detailed questions they want us to advise them on. And we can't do that. Uh, what is right for you depends on a tremendous amount of personal information. And if you are going to be a do-it-yourself investor, you have to start by really understanding these things about yourself. You need to know what you believe, who you trust, what information sources you trust, what or how much do you have, what do you need, how much do you need, what do you want, and what can you do? And there's just no way for me to know all those things. If you engage with a professional to help you, they'll start with all this they'll start with a detailed understanding of you. But if you want to be a do-it-yourself investor, you need to understand all these things too. And so um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on them today because they're individual, but I would encourage you as personal investors, not just to study the market, but also to study yourself and try and really develop a realistic understanding of who you are, because that shapes how you're going to react to the information we're going to talk to today. Now, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I thought I'd give just a little more color on my own personal finance journey. Uh, yes, believe it or not, that little boy in the top right is me. Um, that was me a long, long time ago, and that's my grandfather. And long before that picture was taken, my grandfather taught me to say, I am a financial wizard. Now, he was, he was a guy that had a sense of humor. He also taught me to say Potawatomi Plum when I was learning to speak. I think he just thought they were funny things to hear a little boy say. But it planted a seed. It planted a seed for me that, that as I grew up, and this story was told to me, because of course I didn't remember it, um, it, it left this lasting impression that this was something my grandfather's thought would be important to my future. And although I grew up in a household where investing and personal finance was discussed around the dinner table at times, like most people, when I started working, I didn't think I had very much money and I didn't think investing was where I really needed to focus my energy. Uh, I needed to focus my energy on earning money so that I'd have something to invest. And so like most people, we did a lot of autopilot kinds of things. You know, we opted into a lot of different mutual funds in our 401k. We used the company stock purchase plan. Um, and fortunately, in the long run, it all worked out. And I think that's the way a lot of personal investing stories are. You, you're going to make mistakes along the way, but if you don't take, make too many and they're not too big, it's probably going to work out okay. But as I was approaching retirement, like most people, I started to realize I'm going to have to live off this money I've collected and I'm going to have to manage it in a way that makes sure I don't have to move in with the grandkids. That is the one financial objective I and all of my kids agree to uh, is that I don't want to have to move in with my kids uh, and they don't want me to have to move in with them. So, so as a lot of people do, when I was approaching retirement, I got more serious about investing and I read lots of books. I went to seminars. I uh, read lots of articles. I listened to podcasts. And along the way, I was introduced to this man in the lower left-hand corner, Paul Merriman. And what attracted me to his work was this total lack of conflict of interest. Paul set up the Merriman Financial Education Foundation entirely out of the goodness of his own heart. He worked in the industry for many years, but when he retired, uh, he decided more than anything, he wanted to just be an educator and help people succeed in personal finance. That combined with the fact that he had a lot of data, because I was an engineer and a nerd, uh, really appealed to me. And so I, I reached out to Paul and volunteered and said, hey, could I help you out? And to my surprise, Paul said yes. And that was about six years ago. And since then, I've worked on all the things that Stephanie described. 
And my hope is that because I've been able to learn from Paul and learn from hundreds of listener questions and learn from lots of research that what I present over the course of the next hour will be useful to you. And, you know, as is often the case, it may be what I say, it, it may be something that comes to mind just while we're spending this time together. So I hope that uh, you get something meaningful out of it, each and every one of you. Now, since this is an investing hour that we're going to spend talking, I thought I'd start with one of my heroes in terms of personal finance education, and that's Jack Bogle. Um, this is a picture of him when he was younger. And his advice was incredibly simple. By the time he got late in life, he had distilled it down to a, as little as six words. I don't know that he ever said them all in a row, these six, but he said them really close together. And they were buy right, hold tight, don't peek. And for Jack, buy right meant the S&P 500 or maybe a total market fund. It was, it was really pretty simple. And I think there was great wisdom in where he had gotten to. He'd spent a lifetime interacting with customers, interacting with researchers, doing academic research himself. He knew a tremendous amount of subtle and detailed knowledge, but he also realized that he'd reached a point in life where millions and millions and millions of people were going to hear him. And those millions and millions and millions of people were not like you and me, they weren't going to spend a Saturday listening to a personal finance discussion or presentation. They were not going to read books and articles and dive deep and understand new and different things. And so he realized he only had a minute at most with them, just seconds, and he needed to give them something that would change their lives. And so he distilled his, his new information down to this soundbite, buy right, hold tight, don't peek. Now he said a lot more that was really useful. But I think his wisdom in that distillation was really valuable. And we can look back historically at how the, this, this advice would have worked out for somebody who could buy the S&P 500 and just hold it. And the story is amazing. Um, it's incredibly simple. It tracks the market, which means when your neighbor's thriving, you're thriving. Um, it's very inexpensive. You can get an S&P 500 for free now. Uh, it's historically very effective, but it does have some downsides. And uh, those are primarily that it's volatile throughout your lifetime. And your worst drawdowns because of that volatility actually come in early retirement. So part of the reason he said don't peak is he knew if you peaked, you might freak out and you might change course. And, and so that was a potential drawback to this piece of advice. But for somebody who really didn't peak, they wouldn't even know, right? It, it would have worked out fine. A couple other drawbacks, it only has about a 3% safe withdrawal rate in retirement. And the legacy that it leaves over a lifetime of investing is much greater than the money that, that gets spent during the lifetime. And let me explain the chart on the right, because we're going to look at a lot of charts like this one as we go through today. To compare different investment strategies, what I've done is I've modeled a lifetime of investing of 40 years working and accumulation where you spend 90% and you save 10%. So if you made $100,000 a year over 40 years, in, and, and we'll, we'll say that's, that's just $4 million, you would have saved $400,000. And you would have ended up with 150 times $400,000 and uh, to spend in retirement and in legacy. And the spend is a 4% fixed withdrawal rate where when you retire, you say, how big is my nest egg? I'm going to take 4% of that and increase it with inflation every year. And the legacy is when you die 30 years later, how much is left? So, so that's the model. And there's a Kager over on the right, and I've, I've listed the historical low, median, and high, and I've focused on the median. That's how these numbers are calculated for the bar chart. So it had a very respectable 9.6% return. And then the worst drawdowns. These drawdowns are the decline from the peak balance in your account to the lowest point it goes before it starts coming back up. 
And this is the reflection of volatility. If we go back to 1928 with this investment strategy, there were periods of time across a lifetime where your worst drawdown was over 80%, which is very sobering. Now, if we could only go back to 1970, it would be a better story. It might be about 50%. Um, so the, the worst drawdowns are pretty extreme. Um, and I, I would say that this chart is conservative in that respect, but I'd rather err on the side of being conservative than, than aggressive in setting expectations about risk. And then finally, at the bottom, there's a safe withdrawal rate. And that's how much money you could take out every year across all of the historical periods of time. This is uh, over 1,100 starting months from 1928 through 2022, uh, with looping back to the start when you need to so you can test them all. Um, and the safe withdrawal rate here was a respectable 3%, but not over 4 where a lot of us would probably feel more comfortable if we had a retirement portfolio that had a 4% safe withdrawal rate. Now, the big problem with this chart, and many of you have probably already figured it out, is that this is nominal data. And we don't get to spend nominal dollars, we get to spend real dollars. So there's a lot of inflation that happens across a lifetime. And if I showed this chart, chart to a young person, they'd say, why should I save 10%? I could save 1% and I'd have plenty. But if we adjust it for inflation, we take out the inflation so that you're looking at the dollars you have at the end in terms that are relevant for today, so they have similar purchasing power to today's dollars, it still was a very effective strategy. It delivered this 18 times multiple of what you saved. And uh, I, I, think, I think it's amazing and effective for somebody who could stick with it. But I think we can do a lot better, and we'll, we'll talk about ways to do that. Um, still, I think as a baseline and a starting point, it's not bad. So what are we going to cover today in a little more depth? We're going to talk about diversification, how different kinds of equities and bonds interact to impact the risk and the reward that we get as investors. We're going to talk about fund evaluation. And I'm going to show you an objective approach to choosing best in class funds for equities. And then finally, we're going to talk about behavior and what we how what we do impacts the returns that we get and how to mitigate that or improve it. So let's dive in with this diversification topic first. So diversification to a lot of people just means owning a lot of different stocks, but the academics have done research in recent years that shows that you can you can actually do better than that, that there are different parts of the stock market that move at different times and deliver premiums that are worth more or less than the market at large. And probably the most famous of those is uh, the work done by Fama and French, and these are professors who have since won. Nobel Prizes for this work that was uh, first published in 1992, I believe. And what they did is they looked back and they said, you know, what happens if we look at different parts of the market? Do they grow different amounts? Do they have different amounts of risk? And would combining those different parts of the market deliver different kinds of portfolio behavior? Could you even improve the amount of return you get per unit of risk. So let's let's look at that and kind of break it down. You can go to the Kenneth French website, which I've got listed here at the bottom, and you can actually download this data and kind of redo the research for yourself. They've done the hard work and they've collected these subsets of the market data going way back in time. And what I've got here on the on the page, let me grab a pointer. is the market divided up by size on this axis going from small to medium small to medium to medium large and large and value on this axis and they determine value using book to market which is the inverse of price to book you can think of it as you know are you paying too much for the value of the underlying assets in the company or are you paying a fair price uh, and these funds over in the growth category are funds 
uh, or companies, I should say, that that get slotted into these cells, if you will, are are the the high flying, really popular companies, the ones that everybody thinks are going to grow the fastest and are, and people are willing to pay an extra price to get them. And the value funds or the value companies over on the left are the part of the market that are out of favor and are cheaper. And what you see in their analysis is going back to 1926, a very clear pattern where the value companies over here on the left as a whole did much better than the growth companies as a whole. And the small companies taken as a whole did much better than the big companies taken as a whole. Um, so you've got this pattern and that led to the identification of what they called factors. I like to think of them as attributes. It's just attributes of companies that behave different ways um, that are small in value. Now, one of the criticisms that comes to this kind of research is that things work until they're published and then they don't work anymore. So let's take a quick look at what you see if you look at the 2000 to 2023 same data from the Kenneth French website. And what you see is that the small value part of the market still delivered a very substantial premium, 12.4%. It's the highest return of any box on the page, much higher than the large, uh, the large growth category at 7.63%. But this large value category over here at 5.57% underperformed growth. So the shorter period, the period of time, the more likely it is that these patterns won't deliver. The longer the period of time, the more likely it is that these patterns will deliver. And for those of you sitting in the audience going, well, it sounds like a bunch of hocus pocus, you know, why would this work? I like to believe that companies are valued based on intrinsic business principles. So if you take a value company that's out of favor, where people aren't paying a, a huge extra price to buy it, what they're saying is that I think it's future earnings over the next two, three, four, five years, I believe in, I don't know about years 10, 15, 20. So when I calculate its net present value based on its earnings stream, I'm gonna overweight those early years. And what that means is that a value company is going to be less sensitive to inflation in its valuation. Now, if I look at a growth company in contrast, and what I'm buying is years 10, 15, 20 of its earnings, I'm not buying its short-term earnings. I'm saying in the long run, it's gonna do really, really well. Well, that company's valuation is really dependent on the inflation rate. So these companies are gonna thrive at different times in the economy. Small companies have more room to grow. Value companies, um, because you buy them at a lower premium, have more room to grow. So I think there are intrinsic and fundamental reasons that are not gonna go away. Um, the small value companies are more volatile. There's more risk. You're going to expect a greater return there. So I think these should persist in the future. But remember, going back to my early chart, you have to decide what you believe. If you believe this, then you can take advantage of it. If you don't believe it, you probably shouldn't. So the next question is, how do these interact with one another? Um, and we can take a quick look at that by looking at three very different things. So we'll look at three different assets. We'll look at this one on the bottom, which is short-term treasuries, very low volatility, low expected return. The one in the middle, which is US large cap. You can think of that as the S&P 500, significantly more volatile, but significantly higher return. And then US small cap value, the most volatile and the highest return. And we can think of those as points on the corners of a triangle. So if we look at the, um, the short-term bonds, for example, they had a historical compound annual growth rate of 1.4% and a worst case drawdown of only 4% and a 30-year safe withdrawal rate of 2.8%. So definitely not a home run, but 
if you were looking for ballast in your account, something to give you stability and protect you from volatility, not a bad asset. Stocks, on the other hand, had a much higher compound annual growth rate. By the way, this is going back to 1928 through the year 2022, not including 2023. So their compound annual growth rate was 6.4%. These are real, I should also say that. So these are with inflation removed. Worst case drawdown was 83%. So you, you had to tolerate a lot of ups and downs to earn that added return. But the safe withdrawal rate was 3%. So if you were a retiree and you were thinking, you know, you wanted something that was going to last the longest in retirement, uh, ironically, stocks were ever so slightly better than short-term bonds on their own. And then you have small cap value with a compound annual growth rate of 8.9%. Not surprisingly, you had to tolerate more volatility to get it. So the worst case drawdown was 91%. And the safe withdrawal rate was lower because of that volatility at 2.3%. But none of us are in, going to invest in any one of these things alone. We're going to combine them. So let's look at what happens when we just take simple 50-50 combinations of each of these. So if we take a 50-50 combination of the short-term bonds and the U.S. large cap blend stocks, the compound annual growth rate goes from 1.4% for bonds alone to 4.4% for the 50-50 combination, which is well more than halfway to the 6.4% that stocks earned. Um, you get a drawdown that's quite a bit lower than stocks, which were 83%, you have, but it's quite a bit higher way higher than the short-term bonds uh, because it's 53% for the 50-50 combo. But the surprise, and I find this to be the real big surprise, is that the safe withdrawal rate is high, higher than either one of those alone. The safe withdrawal rate for the 50-50 combo of short-term bonds and large cap blend stocks is almost 4%. It's 3.9%. That's almost up to the 4% that most of us think of as a bogey for a good portfolio in retirement. So what happens on the other side of the triangle over here, combining stocks and small cap value stocks? Well, it's kind of a similar picture. You end up getting a compound annual growth rate that is between stocks and small cap value at 8.1%, a drawdown that's a little bit better than small cap value at minus 87%, and a safe withdrawal rate that's about the same as total stocks. But the even bigger surprise, and I think the biggest surprise, is that the highest safe withdrawal rate on the page is when you combine short-term bonds and small cap value stocks. Now, why would that be? Why would it be that that combination gives you the highest safe withdrawal rate, which is a good indication of the most resilient portfolio to sequence of returns risks? Well, the reason is meaningful diversification. These two things out of the three on the chart are the most different. So when we look at combining very, very stable short-term bonds and very volatile small cap value stocks, we end up getting something where one set of assets is gonna deliver its premium at a very different time from the other set of assets. And that's gonna protect us from both of them going south at the same time. And that's why it has the highest safe withdrawal rate at 4.2%. It still has a pretty high worst case drawdown at minus 61%, but the Kager's a very respectable 6.3%. Again, these are real compound annual growth rates removing inflation. So, so there you go. Um, uh, hi, Chris. I, yeah, 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 go ahead. I see okay. raised hands. Yeah. Yeah, there is a question. Okay, maybe you should answer that. Sure. Uh, Cindy asked, "What is safe withdrawal?" Ah, good question. Thank you for pausing me, and I'm I, I th that level of interaction is perfect. So the safe withdrawal rate means that if you had this portfolio when you enter retirement, and let's say you had a million dollars saved as you enter retirement, and you're going to be retired for thirty years. How much money historically could you have taken out at the beginning as a percentage and then increased with inflation every year 
through your retirement without running out of money. And the way we figure it out is by going back and testing every single start date, starting in January of 1928 and then going to February of 1928 all the way through to the end. And so uh, a 4.2% safe withdrawal rate says if you had a million dollars, you could take out 42,000 in the first year. And then in the second year, you would increase that for inflation, taking out, taking out 42,400 or what, what, whatever it would be. And, um, and historically, you would not have run out of money. That's what the safe withdrawal rate means. And it, it's a worst case analysis because there was only one time in history when that actually happened. And 95% of the time you can take out an extra half a percent over the worst and, and still not run out of money. But people tend to be very conservative when they look at retirement planning. And so they, they like this idea that, well, I never would have run out of money in the past. So that strategy would work in the future. Are we good? Uh, yeah, there's another question maybe you should answer now is um, short term bonds, how short treasure uh, or something else? I used T bills here, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so okay. very short. Yeah, very short. Okay. Yeah, very short. Okay, let's move on. So in the same way that, um, you know, we're trying to distill the essential ingredients of investing here with this identification of small and valued, people have identified the drivers of flavor. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, we all eat, so we all have some, some experience with this. And I think it's always helpful to step out of category and then back in just to have an, an analogous understanding. Uh, food scientists have studied thousands and thousands and thousands of ingredients. You know, there's, there's no limit to the number of things you can put in food. And what they've discovered is that because of the way the human body is, what really drives the flavor in a dish, the flavor in a meal that we're gonna eat is how much we have of these six key attributes, spicy, sour, sweet, salty, umami, and bitter. And I think that's kind of amazing that you can distill something as complex as food and flavor into these six key attributes. Well, in the same way food scientists have done that for flavor, academics have analyzed what it takes to drive different returns, different portfolio or investment returns. And there are different models for this. So you can find a variety of different models, but they all tend to have between three and five key attributes. I've chosen the Fama French model today just because it's from academics. They, they don't have any mixed agenda. They're not selling me anything and they have very long historical data that's available publicly online. So I chose the Fama French five factor model today for this teaching example. And what Fama and French have found um, and, and many others actually in fixed income is that fixed income is driven by two things, term, how long the bond is, and credit risk, how likely the bond is to be repaid. So we're not going to talk any more about fixed income, but it's pretty simple. Those two attributes drive the vast majority of returns in that area. But in the area of equities, um, with the Fama French model, the five attributes that they've identified are the market. So that's basically how much the total market goes up and down compared to risk-free assets the size of the companies that are in the portfolio, the value of the companies that are in the portfolio, basically how much you have to pay to buy the assets that you're getting. Um, so companies with higher price to book would be lower value. Companies with lower price to book would be higher value as an example. The profitability of those companies and the investment of those companies. Uh, and we can actually kind of see this visually if we take a fund and we, we use an example. So uh, the DFA US small cap value one fund, DFSVX, is a good example of a, 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 I would call it a near best in class small cap value fund here in the United States. And so the question is, how much would I need of these different ingredients to make that 
funds returns. And you can you can go online and you can get this data. I'll show you where to get it. Um, these actually all of the data in these charts down here at the bottom came from that Kenneth French website that I I showed earlier. Um, you can look at what has the market factor done in the past. So so how has the market factor shown up at different points in times? How has the size factor shown up at different points in time? The value factor, profitability and investment. And then you can say, well, using something called a regression analysis, how much of what, what would the recipe be? How much would I need of each of these to make up this small cap value set of returns? And would there be anything I'd have to add or subtract to it to take, uh, take into account, for example, expense ratios or inefficiencies of the fund having cash on the side or various other things? And then you can also get something out of this regression analysis called R squared, which tells you how well did the model work? And in this case, the model worked uh, to model 97.5% of the past returns. And you can see that by looking at what the returns of the model created using that analysis looked like in the past compared to the actual fund. And I don't know about you, but I look at this and I think, wow, that is amazingly close. <laughs> I mean, these lines are almost on top of each other. And that's what that 97.5% means. So this is really what attributes that the, the academics have found tell us you know, are driving these returns in the marketplace. To get these premiums though, to get the added return from small, the added return from value, the added return from, was there another question? Um, okay, okay, yeah, for the last page. Sure. There's a question is, uh, is US considered preferable to global for small cap value? It's better for U.S. than global, I guess the question. Yeah, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, we, we in our portfolios, and I'll show you some of the portfolios later, include U.S. and international. Uh, it's easier to do this kind of an analysis, though, on a U.S. fund or an external, uh, like an international fund, than it is to do it on a global fund. Um, but from an investing standpoint, our portfolios all recommend that you have some U.S. and some international, not all of them, um, but we would say that's a good starting point, and then it comes down to personal comfort. Um, so this is just a teaching example. We'll get into portfolios in a, in a little bit. So one key thing to remember, though, is that to get these premiums, you have to tilt. And what do I mean by that? Well, some bogleheads in particular will say, I own the total market. I have small, I have value, I have profitable comp companies, I have high investment companies, I have companies that have good momentum, I have companies with bad momentum, I, I own it all, I get all the premiums. That's not the way it works. Um, what happens if you own the total market is that the growth that you own offsets the value the large that you own offsets the small. The only way you get a premium or you get the diversification benefits of any of these different parts of the market is to own them disproportionately, to own a little more or a little bit less than the total market. And that leads us to this idea of portfolios that tilt. And at the Merriman, Foundation, the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, we have a number of portfolios that our followers are very familiar with. Uh, there's the worldwide ultimate buy and hold portfolio, which is fairly complex. It has 10% across all of these different asset classes. And these asset classes are uh, US large cap blend or the S&P 500, US large cap value, US small cap blend, U.S. small cap value, REIT, international large cap blend, international large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value, and emerging markets. So to that listener's question earlier, or, or uh, audience question earlier, most of our portfolios include U.S. and international, but some of them, and in fact, we'll talk more about this one portfolio 
in a minute, this worldwide four fund, for example, I uh, use US large cap blend, US small cap value, international large cap value, and international small cap blend, just to simplify things. So it's still half in small, half in large, half in value, half in blend. Uh, but it's um, it, it achieves that with a subset of the funds to make it more manageable and easier for investors. <clears throat> and on our website, we're I'm not going to spend time on the tables. If you've watched Paul present, you'll know that he spends a lot of time going through the historical data that we have on the website and these tables. And I think it's tremendous work. This is the the work of Daryl Balls. Uh, and you can go and look and see how each of these strategies that I just pointed out on that slide have done historically. You can look at how they've done with a lump sum. You can look at how they've done with uh, a very uh, with uh, ongoing contributions. You can look at how they have done with larger and smaller amounts of bonds. That's the fine tuning table. So that you can pick a combination that suits your level of, of risk capacity or tolerance. Um, you can look at how they've done through the decades in these quilt charts. Uh, there's even a calculator uh, created by uh, by Craig that I think is really fun because you can play with your own assumptions about cash flows and pick a portfolio and your own splits US and international. So uh, I just wanted to mention that because the rest of the presentation, I'm not going to be talking about these tables and charts that Paul often talks about, but they are there, they're free, and they can give you a tremendous amount of information. And there are people, I think, who are more inclined to that kind of information than my style of presentation. And that's part of the reason I like working with Paul is that we give people choice. So let's look at that Merriman Worldwide Four Fund portfolio I just described in a similar way to, to how we've looked at the previous all S&P 500. Even though it's four funds, it's still very simple, but it's actually much more diversified than the S&P 500. It's still very inexpensive. Um, and historically, it has had much greater returns than the S&P 500. And it's had a much higher safe withdrawal rate, almost a 4% safe withdrawal rate. The minuses are that it doesn't track the market. So you have to, if you want to get a different result, you have to tolerate a different ride. If you want to get to a different destination, you have to go down a different path. And for some people, that's very, very hard to do because it means that there may be years, there may be many years where choosing this strategy underperforms a simple S&P 500 strategy. And if you step in and out of strategies, you will never get the benefits of them. So, so that is a, a big thing to understand about yourself. Do you know enough about the history to pursue, pursue something that's different? Um, this, like the S&P 500, also has high volatility throughout. And its worst drawdowns, like the S&P 500, come early in retirement. And the legacy spending is much greater than what you spend in retirement. But again, if we compare to the S&P 500 we looked at before and go back and forth, you can see you have a much greater long-term real return than you had with the S&P 500. And I think the real kicker is down here on the right. It's this safe withdrawal rate. If I'm a retiree, I would much rather be in a portfolio that's meaningfully diversified, like the worldwide, worldwide four fund portfolio here, that is going to give me greater protection against sequence of returns risk than an all S&P 500 portfolio that lacks that diversification. So I... Uh, the next step is to go on to fund evaluation. Before we do, I, I, I just, I'm going to pause and say, does anybody have an urgent question about meaningful diversification and, and what we talked about? Okay, there is one question. Uh, are you rebalancing uh, every year with uh, these portfolios? That's a great question. And on this one, uh, yes, this is rebalanced annually. 
on some of the ones we'll talk about coming up. I'll be very clear about it. Um, we won't be. So it, it varies. But yes, on, on uh, well, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one. On the worldwide four fund, I assumed annual rebalancing. The S&P 500, there's no rebalancing because it's just one fund. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to fund selection then. Um, one of the questions I get is, how do I do my best in class uh, identification of funds? And, it, it, you know, choosing funds, it's really interesting. We had somebody uh, years ago when I was making one of my early presentations say, I have a much better way of choosing funds than you. Uh, and we all said, well, what is it? And he said, well, I go to Morningstar and I just pick by, based on how many stars are there. You know, if he believes in that and it's working for him, I, I really, I think if it helps him stay the course, it's fine. I don't personally find that the best way to pick funds because I know that their ratings vary frequently over time and they have to do with a variety of things that are, are less relevant to me as a buy and hold investor over the long term. But it just goes to show there's all kinds of different ways you could choose to pick funds. You could pick just based on what's cheapest. You could say, all I care about is expense ratio. I'm Vanguard all the way. And if they have two funds in the same category, I'm gonna take the, take the one with the lower expense ratio. You could go with the one that's the most efficient, has the least turnover. Uh, you could go with the funds that have the least style drift. You, could, you can actually look on Morningstar and see how stable the style has been. Um, you could say, I want the smallest funds or the most value discounted funds, and there are metrics for that as well. So there's a lot of different ways you could do it. To me, all of these only capture a part of the picture, and I prefer something that is a more holistic view. And so going back to these ingredients that make up the way a fund is going to perform, I like to look inside the fund and see how it's done in the past and what drove its performance in the past, and then use that to set expectations about what it might do in the future or what it hopefully will do in the future. And the, the website I use for that is free. It's called portfoliovisualizer.com. And on its homepage, you'll see this box called factor analysis. And there's something called a factor regression, which is basically this chart right here. And it's how I've been getting all those numbers that you saw on the previous charts. You type in a fund like DFSVX, and it spits out these loading is what it's called. But these are the attributes. It's like how much of that fund's performance was driven by these different characteristics in the past. So it's really easy to use. You can all use it. There's also a page called Factor Statistics which is important because it tells us how much have these premiums been worth in the past. So the market factor has been worth 5.52%. The size factor, 2.18%. The value factor, almost 3%. And the profitability and the investment factors worth about 3%, a little over 3%. And there's even, and I'll show you this at the end, a page where you can download thousands you can download these statistics on thousands of funds if you want to build your own screener so so i'll show you that but since you can go and you can get all this information it makes it really easy to compare funds based on their expected return if you make a few simple assumptions so we already figured out what made up what the recipe was what makes up the ingredients, if you will, of this US small cap fund DFSVX at a 0.3% expense ratio. <clears throat> we can also look and see what these premiums have been worth in the past. So we've got these premiums down here. And if we take these premiums and we multiply them times the amount of exposure that the fund has to each of them, and we add that together along with, oops, sorry about that. Can I undo that? Nope, can't undo it. And then we subtract, and then we, we add them together and we subtract off this alpha, which is kind of the everything else. It's the expense ratio and, and anything else the fund does. We get a number that says 
what the expected return would be in the future if the premiums match the past and if the fund exposure to those premiums matches the past. And in this case, it's 8.6% above risk-free. Now you could assume a certain risk-free return and add it in there, but if all you're doing is trying to pick between funds, you can ignore that. You don't need to, because you just want to know which one's higher. <clears throat> and so what would happen if we said, let's compare this to the Vanguard small cap value index fund VISVX, which is a lot cheaper. It's 0.19% expense ratio. Well, if we go through all the same analysis, we end up with a number down here on the bottom right that's 7.3%. So comparing those, it's 8.6% versus 7.3%. I would favor the one that's 8.6% in my analysis because it's giving me a collective sum of exposure to these academically studied factors or attributes that is worth a little bit more. The other reason I would favor it is that it has a little bit higher R squared. It's 97.5%, whereas um, the Vanguard fund is 95.3%. The lower that number, the less accurate the model, the more likely it is somebody inside the fund is doing something to second guess the trades and not be systematic. Um, so I, most of the funds that I choose are 97.5, 97% or better uh, in terms of how well the model, the model fits. So that's, that's how I would objectively rank the funds. But then I would also look at a number of other attributes. I would look at the expense ratio, the number of holdings, the turnover, the parent company, the fund manager, and the methodology. And I do crack open the, the descriptions of these funds and read how they're managed and, and whether or not it fits with my investing methodology. And, uh, you know, I would encourage you to do the same before you invest. Now, I mentioned that if you want to, you can go to the website on this page called Fund Factor Regressions and you can choose all of the funds that have a high R squared, and you can choose a different model. I've used Fama French five factor model here. And then you can click on Excel and download thousands of funds and their data all at once. So have at it. <laughs> you can go into your own best in class analysis spreadsheet. And if you find something different than I've found, let me know. I would love to know. <clears throat> And if you're lazy and on the other end of the spectrum, you just want to know the answer uh, on our website and the URLs here at the bottom, you can find our list of recommendations. And I update this about once every two years. So these are the funds here in this column, the best in class uh, column. These are the funds that made it to the top of my best in class list and represent the funds that I think have the best chance of the highest return over the long term by providing meaningful exposure to these ingredients that we're looking to tilt towards for diversification and added returns. And they're there for each and every one of these asset classes that we recommend in our funds, or I mean, in our portfolios. Now on the right hand side, you'll see a list of alternative recommendations. They're not best. Uh, they didn't do as well in my analysis, but the reason we list them is we recognize that a lot of investors, perhaps in their 401k or in their Fidelity account or somewhere else, won't have access to all of these funds in a com commission-free fashion. And so uh, we try to identify funds that are close and are still good and recommendable within those families. And those are on the right. And we also on the website have a number of mutual fund recommendations. So uh, there you go. That's, that's the way I tend to do my uh, objective fund analysis and, uh, and try to identify best in class funds. So the next section is behavior. And um, unless we have any urgent questions, Stephanie, do we have any urgent questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. One of the question is: is is your uh, the, I mean uh, discussion also apply to ETF? So yes, it does. Uh, I I always trip over that exchange traded funds. To me, they're all funds. Mutual funds. They're all funds. So um, yeah, these are all ETFs, and. Um, 
this analysis, these were mutual funds. Yes. So, but it works the same way. It, it's exactly the same. You just type in three letters instead of five. Yeah. Anything else? Um, there's still quite a few questions. Maybe those should wait until after you complete. All right. We'll come back to them. We will yeah. definitely come back to them. Okay. All right. So behavior, uh, this, is, uh, this is a fun section. It's harder to put data on this. I wish I had more. Um, this is an area where I really wish I had more. Uh, if you go to Bogle's advice, buy right, hold tight, don't peek, I think it will encourage good behavior, but I'm not sure how practical it is, especially for those in this audience. Um, you know, if you're interested enough to sit around on a Saturday watching an hour presentation, hour and a half presentation on finance, you're probably going to peak. <laughs> I think most of you probably looked at your accounts once or twice. And so I tried to come up with a list that I think captured some of the best advice I've received. Clearly, starting early in automating is one of the best things a young investor can do. And we live in a fantastic world where a lot of young investors will be defaulted into a target date fund at a savings rate that grows up to 10% with a match by their employer. And, um, you know, I would be delighted if each and every one of my children ended up in that situation. And even if they did nothing else, as we'll see in a couple of minutes, that would be great. It, it's a really wonderful solution. And automation gets rid of a whole bunch of other problems on the list because it does encourage this not peaking. It gets you to not think about the money you're giving up to save because it's just taken out before you ever even see it. So I think that's hugely important. The second thing, though, is to educate yourself. I think educated investors are able to do more. And uh, it's really important to understand how educated or uneducated you are. And I don't mean that as a pejorative. There are a lot of things to learn about in life. Some people will do fine financially without developing a deep understanding of personal finance, but those people probably should follow a simpler course. And uh, it's important that they know that and they understand it. But people who are willing to learn a lot more have a lot more capacity to follow a different path. The third thing is understanding your goals, short term and long term. You know, if you can if you can zoom out, it helps a lot with behavior because it it helps you to not be so stressed out about the fact that your account balance is up or down today. It helps you to, you know, take the long view and say, well, I don't really need to cash out of any of my investments today. So the fact that it's down doesn't really matter. I'm investing for my retirement, say, or I'm investing for my legacy, whatever it is. Um, the more you can zoom out and think about the long term and the more you can have your short term needs addressed. You know, if you're a retiree, there's a lot to be said for carrying a year's worth of cash. I know it costs in terms of your long term return, but that peace of mind helps you ignore the volatility of the rest of your portfolio. So understanding those short-term and long-term goals and then tuning your plan to meet them, I think is very, very powerful. And then focusing on process and discipline. Um, I had to do a trade recently as part of our planning. And one of the things I did was I went and I got my financial partner, my wife, to come in and look over my shoulder and just double check everything I was doing and help us be calm about it and talk about it and say this is the right thing to do we're not doing it because we're excited or greedy or whatever um, it just helps and i think that sounding board helps to focus on the process and the discipline and not the emotion and and that leads into this control emotions uh, it's easier said than done but um i you know emotions are our worst enemy when it comes to personal finance and investing and then avoid market timing like the plague. And this is, again, easier said than done, uh, especially uh, as a retiree. You have to decide you know, when you're going to take your withdrawals, when you're going to sell some stock maybe to fund your withdrawal, when you're, you know, there's a lot of timing decisions that you have to make. And uh, I, I know in Paul's case, he just systematically does them at the beginning of the year. And I think, actually, I think he has them done for him at the beginning of the year. So he has automated it and taken the emotion out of it and taken the market timing out of it. 
And, and so there's a lot to be said for that. And we'll see, I have some data on that. Market timing can really hurt you. Uh, stay, infor stay informed and ignore the hype. This is tied to the educating yourself, but I think the ignore the hype part is important because it's so easy to get caught up in the emotional media around personal finance, the excitement of the market being up, the fear of the market being down, the prognosticator who seems to know the future and has painted it so darkly. Uh, none of that is really real or true. Nobody really knows the future. So the more you can just be calm and, and uh, be a little zen on all of that, the better off you'll be. And then I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again and I'll say it at the end, um, know yourself. It's really, really important. You don't take more risk than you have the talent and ability to tolerate. So let's look at a little bit of data. Um, okay, it's, Chris, has yeah, sure. one question. One question is uh, what is market timing? Someone asked that question. Ah, Mark, okay, great question. So market timing is when you say, I think the market is going to go down, so I should sell some today. Or I think the market is going to go up later, so I'm going to sit on the side. I, or, or it's going to keep going down, so I'm going to sit on the sidelines. It's trying to decide when to be in and out of the market. Uh, and as opposed to following Jack Bogle's extremely wise advice of buy right, hold tight, don't peek. So most of the evidence says that even professionals who, who follow systematic approaches to market timing, they can lower their volatility and get about the same return, but they can't really improve returns by doing that. And you and me, amateur investors, or even, you know, deeply engaged amateur investors, I think, have little chance of beating professionals that do this for a living and have, there's, there's very little history that any of them have done it extremely well. So you're just, it's, it's easier and more likely to produce a good result to not try and know when to be in the market and when to be out of the market and rather just be in the market. Yeah. And here, here's the first evidence of that. Um, this is the Dalbar study through December 31st of 2022 showing what the average equity fund investor got versus just the S&P 500. And you could have got the S&P 500 return just by buying an S&P 500 fund. I mean, maybe you would have paid 0 0.01, 0 0.02% for it. Not very much, right? But you could have gotten essentially that return. And instead, the average fund investor got 6.81%, almost a 3% difference. And why is that? Well, it's partly down to market timing, but it's also down to fund selection. A, a lot of investors choose expensive funds or are sold expensive funds and pay too much in expense ratios. A lot of investors end up in funds that don't really add up to be a meaningful portfolio. There's been research done that shows that the, the average target date fund investor in switching from their do-it-yourself portfolio to a target date fund saw their expected return increase by over 2%. So there's just a lot to be said for following a simple approach that has been advised to you for the average investor. Now, I'm not saying everybody here on the call today is an average investor, but many of us are probably more average than we think. That's the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? Most of us overestimate our abilities. So I think it's good to take a chart like this with a, a dose of humility and say, you know, there's a lot to be said for just, just following the market. Um, the market timing question, you know, what is the cost of market timing? Well, if you go back for the past 20 years, and you had invested a hundred thousand dollars for those 20 years and been in the market the whole time you would have gotten 9.78 percent and ended up with six hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you had decided to step in and out of the market at different points in time and had missed just the best five days only five days your compound annual growth rate dropped by two and a half percent if you'd missed the best 10, it drops down to 5.5%. And if you'd missed 40 of the best days, you actually get a negative return. 
And the problem is a lot of times these best days come right after the worst days. So it's easy to say the market's going to hell in a handbasket and I want out. It's hard to then know when to get back in while it's still going to hell in a handbasket and about to turn around. And it's just too easy to miss that first really big up day on the way back or the second one or the third one or the fourth one. And so it, this is why most of us would just be far better off buying, holding, looking away. I, you know, and it's a pile of work, right? To decide when to get in, when to get out is really a pile of work. It's hard. It'd be much, much easier and better for your work-life balance probably to and your health to be able to look away. So, um, so far we've been talking all about buy and hold and there is a, a big problem with buy and hold and it has to do with life. <laughs> it, it has to do with the fact that as we live our lives, things happen to us. And it, it, you know, some of it happens to all of us and some of it happens to us individually. There are good things that happen and bad things that happen. There are good choices we make and bad choices that we make. And throughout our lifetime, that moves us up and down on this axis on the left, which is our risk tolerance or our risk capacity. So as a young person, we have very little risk capacity. We depend entirely on our parents. When we start working, we have high risk capacity because we have all these years to work and to let compounding to work for us. If we lose our total net worth at the age of 25, most of us, it's not that big a deal because it wasn't very big. Um, but as we approach retirement and all our working years are starting to be in the rear view mirror, and those compounding years or history, they're no longer in front of us, our risk capacity tends to decline. It tends to, to go down. And if you buy right, hold tight and don't peak, there's no way to take into account the fact that this is changing. If, if you want to lower your risk capacity approaching retirement as a do-it-yourself investor, that kind of implies you're gonna add bonds. Well, that means looking, it means trading, it means doing things. So the financial industry recognized this. They recognized that the average person's human capital or their risk capacity declines with age, and they invented something called the target date fund. And some of you are familiar with them, and some of you probably aren't, and many of you probably don't use them because they're relatively new compared to the age of our audience, I think. Uh, but you almost certainly know somebody who does because 60 to 80% of retirees in 401ks use a target date fund, and many of them almost exclusively use a target date fund. So these are very, very important to the future, and they should be they they do this amazing thing what they do is they adjust for your risk capacity changing with age by changing the amount they have allocated to equities and the amount they have allocated to safer bonds with time so they start out with a high equity allocation and then as we age sort of in the 40s they start to ramp down the equities and ramp up the bonds till at retirement, you're about 50-50, and into retirement, they continue ramping it down to where you might even be 60-40 or 70-30, where the larger percentage in retirement is allocated to bonds. So um, you can see how this plays out with one example. These are the Vanguard Target Retirement Funds, and the, the simplicity is genius. If you are a new college hire at in 2020 and you plan to work for 40 years until you retire in 2060 you would pick the 2060 target date fund you pick the one that's got a year that's close to when you think you'll probably retire and you can default and automate this in your 401k it'll probably happen for you automatically in many companies today and it just happens in the background this changing glide path happens with no involvement from you uh it it's really cool because in these early years when you can take a lot of risk you do and in these later years when you're starting to want more confidence in the balance of your account as you're approaching retirement and you want less volatility and risk that's what you get it, it just it comes along for free almost and we can do a similar analysis on a target date fund to what we did for our previous investment strategies and look at a lifetime 
uh, of somebody across 40 years. And what we see, it, it, and, and this looks small over here, right? But keep in mind, this is a really different strategy. Everything we've looked at so far was 100% equities all the time. Most people won't invest that way. Most people are gonna add some bonds over time, and this does it automatically. And we'll talk in a second about whether that smallness is a problem or not. I don't think it is, and I'll show you why. But it's incredibly simple. It's very inexpensive. The Vanguard target retirement funds are 0.08%, I think, expense ratio. Historically, very effective. Um, the volatility declines nearing retirement. This is the first one of these strategies we've looked at where that was true. So the worst drawdown happens around age 42, and it was about 64%, not too bad, one of the lower ones we've looked at. But the worst drawdown approaching retirement was only 48%. And if you went back to the 1970s, this would probably be in the 30s, 30-ish30, percent, 32%, somewhere in there. And what that means is you have much more confidence in the amount of money that you are going to have going into retirement because you don't have to derate your nest egg by as much. And that's that's really powerful. And then finally, look at the safe withdrawal rate. It's almost 4% at 3.7%. So, so it's really good. And you get to spend more than you leave to your heirs. Now, I know some heirs in the audience may be upset by that, but most of us, <laughs> most of us are going to be happy to have more access to our money while we're alive, um, even if we gift it to our heirs. So there's a lot of different ways that could play out. It does have this lower total dollar return, though, and I know some of you are asking, is that multiplier of seven all that bad? So let's let's look at it. Let's assume that our investor makes $100,000 a year over 40 years, and they save $10,000 per year. That means they're spending $90,000 a year while they're working. So their nest egg would be seven times 40 years is, uh, times $10,000 a year is $2.8 million. If retirement is 30 years, that's $93,000 a year that you have in retirement you actually have more to spend in retirement than you spent while you were working. And if the employer match adds 10%, that takes it up to $102,000 a year. And many, many employers do have a match. And Social Security may add even more. So I think the expectation is a good one. It's not a bad one. There is a caveat the returns vary up here. And this is true on all of our strategies, right? You might be on the low end, you might get a 3.4% return. You might be on the high end, you might get a 5.9% return. And because of that variability, that's one of the reasons I advise people investing in a target date fund to save between 10 and 20%. Because if you save 15, you know, those numbers all start to look better on a 3.4% growth rate. Um, so, uh, I think it's a very prudent and good strategy, but it does beg a question. Could we do better? Could we use some of what we learned about meaningful differentiation to improve? And the simplest way to do that that I can think of is you put 90% into the target date fund and 10% into a U.S. small cap value fund. So that means out of every dime that you're saving towards retirement, nine pennies go into the target retirement fund and one penny goes into small cap value. You don't do any rebalancing because maybe you have to access small cap value in a separate fund. And you take 4% fixed annual retirement withdrawals from the fund that's bigger to nudge it back to the right uh, allocation. So what do I mean in that nudging there? Well, it means that if you're going to take your 4% withdrawal and you look in the account and the target date fund has 92% of the allocation, you would take your total withdrawal from the target date fund. On the other hand, if small cap value is bigger than it's supposed to be, let's say it's at 11%, you would take that total withdrawal from the small cap value fund. Now, this does mean you're kind of overshooting a little bit, but over time it all averages out and, and it's a very simple way to do it. And for most people, they're gonna be taking more often from the fund that's been growing faster, like the small cap value fund, and they're gonna feel pretty good about it because they're taking some profit. <clears throat> so if we look at that, 
this 90-10 strategy with no rebalancing except for the nudge withdrawals, it actually increases the amount you have between the spend in retirement and the legacy by about 40% so that now you're up to a 10 times multiplier and it improved the safe withdrawal rate. It is a little bit more volatile. So you go to 66% as the worst drawdown in the early years and 56% approaching retirement. But on the whole, it, you know, it seems to help. And I think there's a lot of people who could live with this. And I think that's important. Now, People always ask me, as soon as you give them a way to dial the knob a little bit, well, what happens if you dial it a little bit more? So, so if we did the same thing with an 80-20 allocation, well, now you've more than doubled the amount that you have in the combination uh, in retirement. But look what's happening to the risk. Uh, I mean, in one sense, the risk went down. Your safe withdrawal rate went up in retirement. So that's a good thing. You're more resilient to sequence of returns risk in retirement. But your worst drawdown approaching retirement now is up at 63%. And that's almost the same as your worst drawdown in the early years. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot of people who could live with this, but it takes more discipline, more knowledge, and more willingness to tolerate volatility, especially in those later years. And dialing it to 11, um, some people who follow our work really like Paul's uh, ultimate buy and hold strategy, which is one half in large, one half in small, one half in value, one half in blend. And uh, so what would happen if you did a 50-50 strategy where you achieve a similar kind of allocation using the target date fund and small cap value, but you rebalance annually? So it's more complicated, but it's still pretty simple. And the answer is, historically at least, you would have done extremely well. Um, but again, now the, the risk that you have to tolerate to earn this extremely well is much higher. The worst drawdown is 81%. The worst drawdown near retirement is 81% as well. So you're really not seeing much of that decline that you want to see in risk approaching retirement, but still a very respectable safe withdrawal rate of greater than 4%. So um, why not dial it to 12 and go all in on small cap value? And um, the answer here is really simple. I think a lot of people in the audience have already figured this out, right? You, know, you have to tolerate a different ride, but how long do you have to tolerate a different ride to get a different return? If you've invested 10% in small cap value and it underperforms for a few years, and by underperforms, it might perform as well as the S&P 500, but just not outperform it, or maybe it underperforms it by 3% per year or 5% per year, who knows? If it's only 10% of your portfolio, you may not even know, and you'll be able to live with it. But if it's 20%, 30%, 40% of your portfolio, it may bother you a lot. And this chart shows how long you might have to wait for small cap value to outperform uh, a large cap blend fund. And this is going all the way back to 1928. And this is from a chart at IFA.com. If you go out, well, first of all, in the front end, it's a coin toss, right? So in a month, you've got practically no chance that either one's going to outperform. It's a, it's a coin flip. At one year, it's still pretty close to a coin flip. Even at five years, there's about a 40% chance that the large cap blend would have outperformed. 15 years, which is a lifetime for a lot of investors, a lot of chances to second guess. You still have a 15% chance that large cap blend has outperformed. And at 20 years, there's a non-zero chance. There's a 0.5% chance historically that the large cap blend would have outperformed small cap value. So I think it's really important that anybody who wants a different return understand they may have to wait a long time to get it and they may have to tolerate a different ride to get it. So just by way of summary, I took all of the simulations that I've shown today and I put them on a single chart. Um, on the horizontal axis, this is the worst drawdown seen since 1928. On the vertical axis, it's the median lifetime compound annual growth rate. And then the labels of the funds um, and the safe withdrawal rates are on them. And we started out over here with the S&P 500 with a 3% safe withdrawal rate. And I think what we've come up with as we've gone through our journey today are a lot of things that are only a little bit more complicated, 
but are often a higher return per unit of risk. So for example, the worldwide four fund annual rebalancing had a better safe withdrawal rate, a better compound annual growth rate, and a lower worst case drawdown. The same was true for this 50-50 um, target date fund small cap value with annual rebalancing. The 80-20 target date fund with small cap value achieves a much higher safe withdrawal rate. This is the highest on the chart and a slightly better, I'd call it the same within the resolution of the, the charts and the back tests and everything, about the same return as the S&P 500, but at much, much lower risk. So that's, that's a big improvement in terms of return per unit of risk. And we showed something that for somebody who maybe is a nervous Nelly and doesn't want a lot of volatility, this Vanguard like target date fund down here with a 3%, 3.7% safe withdrawal rate. And it's perfectly fine, super simple, and the smoothest ride on the chart. So uh, I think we've explored a lot of interesting space and hopefully it's been useful. Um, I wanna come back to what kind of an investor are you? Because you really have to know after looking at all of this, whether you know whether it appealed, you may have started out this presentation as the investor that just wants to kind of be a boglehead and fly on the surface and just get the market return. Um, you may be more like the puffin who's willing to dive deep. It's really up to you to decide. And I just messed something up. Give me just a second. I'm going to have to. Discard that and go back into presentation mode. So in summary, um, I, I, I've given you hopefully an impassioned plea to diversify meaningfully, not just to diversify, diversify by owning thousands of companies, but to diversify by tilting to different parts of the market that represent different kinds of companies that are going to perform at different points in time. Um, evaluate your funds holistically. So when you're trying to pick between funds, don't just focus on one thing like small cap values, uh, expense ratio, or how tilted it is to small in value, or whether the fund is free, but consider all of the things that are going to drive its return and all of the things gonna, that are going to keep you confident in it and let you stay the course, staying invested in it. And then pick a path that's right for you. You can pick an easy path like the S&P 500 or a target date fund. And I would argue the target date fund is much easier. It's a smoother ride that the S&P 500 is actually going to be hard in terms of its volatility. Um, but you have to pick one that's right for you. And if you want to invest differently for a different return, make sure you're willing to study and learn enough that you can stay the course to get the return. And then finally, be patient. It's just far too easy in the world of investing to learn the wrong lesson, to invest for a short period of time, to look at a short period of returns and make the wrong conclusion about the long-term prospects for that investment. So um, if you wanna learn more, please go to our website, www.paulmerriman.com for books, articles, fund recommendations, videos, podcasts, it's all free. And in fact, if you sign up for the free newsletter there, you can get free PDFs of Paul's recent book, We're Talking Millions, and my deep dive into the two fund for life strategies, um, which I think of kind of as an owner's manual for it, because it tries to answer all the questions that might come up over a lifetime. And um, with that, there's a disclaimer. This is uh, provided for information and entertainment purposes only. It's not to advise you. If you need advice, go get an advisor. And um, with that, I think we're at the point we can take some questions. So uh, Stephanie, I'm hoping we have some. Do we have some questions? Yeah, we have many questions. Awesome, that's great. Okay, um, I just saw one was the kind that you just talked about. Um, now I lost that, let's see. Yeah, one of the question was asking is in your study, you are going back to 1928, so long ago. Why don't you use 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years in, I mean, 
instead, I guess you kind of answer that question, right? Longer time is better. Well, so I, you know, we have analyses on our website that go back to 1970, and we have analyses that go back to 1928. Uh, one of the things that I did in this presentation was talked about safe withdrawal rate as a reflection of the resiliency of funds uh, or portfolio strategies. And some of the worst times for safe withdrawal rates were before the 1970s. So I go back to the 1920s because then I think it captures a more complete picture of the risk. There are people who would say we have better regulatory environments now and some of the risks of the Great Depression would not happen again. Uh, and that that it's overly conservative to reflect those risks in portfolios moving forward. Uh, I, I'm not so sanguine. I tend to think that uh, you know, the, the unknown possibilities in the future are the things that, including 1928, helps, helps us to try and capture. But uh, the, analysis, the analysis, the way it works, is I did this 40 years accumulation, 30 years of uh, distribution. So every scenario that I tested was only 70 years long only, only 70 years long, but they started at every beginning date available in that history. So um, uh, it, it, it is kind of a little, a little of both there were, you know, it wasn't using all uh, 1100 plus samples in every analysis, um, but, every, and that's why there's a range of scenarios, why you get low, medium and high returns, because sometimes you have a lucky start date and sometimes you have an average start date and sometimes you have an unlucky start date. Okay, um, here's a question. Can you point me to a resource where I can go into the weeds about how you select best in class funds? I think you have show that screen, right? Uh, there's actually an AAII article that I wrote where I uh -huh. talked about uh, the, uh, the math. Um, so if you find, I think I've only written uh, less than 10 articles. It's probably five or six articles at AAII so far. So if you go on AAII and look for me as an author, it'll be one of those articles. Okay. Uh, another question. Is there a place for gold, Bitcoin? Gold and Bitcoin? A gold or Bitcoin. Yeah. It's just a gold or Bitcoin. Right. Um, <laughs> I, you, I assume he means he's asking in in the investing portfolio, is there a right, place for them? Right, right, right. There's not a place for them in my portfolio, but I'll tell you why people add gold in portfolios. It's not to increase the return. It's to reduce the volatility under, under certain market conditions. So if you can be like Jack Bogle recommends and buy and hold and not peak, the volatility doesn't really matter to you. Um, but if you're a normal human and you're going to react to the volatility and you're going to be emotional about it, adding gold a, and allocation to gold can reduce the volatility in certain periods of history. At least that's what the history says. We don't include it in our portfolios because we think it's an unnecessary complexity. We think that you have other ways to mitigate volatility with short-term bonds, for example. Um, and if you look at gold, gold has a, a long-term return that's similar to inflation and short-term bonds have a long-term return that's similar to inflation, but short-term bonds are far, far less volatile. So we don't, see a place for gold other than you know the fact that if you own a total market fund or you own a, a broad set of funds like a target date fund you own some exposure to gold it's it's in there but we don't we don't include a special allocation and then bitcoin um i don't personally understand the long term story for bitcoin uh, if it became the de facto currency standard for the world and governments didn't create their own substitutes for it, maybe someday in the future. But I, I, yeah, I just, I don't, that seems like a very, very improbable path forward. And so in the short term, it seems like a greater fool strategy where you're really just saying, 
it's worth this much today. And if I buy it, I hope there are greater fools tomorrow who will pay more for it when I can sell and then I can get out. But it just, it doesn't have any long-term story for why it should outperform and grow uh, and not be replaced or supplanted by something else. Uh, it, that's that's my personal view on it. It's uh, it's not a deeply researched one. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay, here's an interesting question. Uh, Chris, great presentation. If your risk tolerance is different than your spouse, how do you invest? Do you split the difference compromise? Do you invest based on the lower risk tolerance or higher? Wow, what a great question. Um, yeah, I. my starting point would be have a long conversation about why each of you has the, you believes that you should take a certain amount of risk and try to come to a common understanding because I, I genuinely believe that in most circumstances, neither party has all of the information. You know, usually there's wisdom on both sides and information and judgment on both sides that's valuable. So my starting point would be to try to come to a consensus and uh, or a compromise and figure out why um, you know why the one person wants less risk and why the other person wants more risk if you can't do that then yeah you could split the difference you could have different accounts you could um, you could average it uh, but uh, but i really think there's a tremendous amount of value in that conversation and one of the hardest parts I know for me, uh, Susanna, my wife, doesn't like to spend a lot of her mental cycles on investing. It's just not a fascinating topic for her. So getting her to engage in the conversation in a meaningful way or for any length of time can be tricky. But again, I think she has wisdom and knowledge about our situation in life and our circumstances and why we should or shouldn't take more or less risk. And so we do regularly engage on those conversations and I always find it useful. Okay, uh, I have this question here. Will this best in class funds work with a portfolio of someone who is already retired? If not, then what is the solution? So I can make no guarantees about how the best in class funds will work in the future, uh, just like nobody can guarantee any of these asset classes or funds will perform in the future. But I also like to remember that the best predictor of the future we have is the past, you know, my weather forecast is uncertain. Um, but I trust it. And so, you know, there's a certain amount of trust that we have to we have to move forward with faith really you have to you have to believe the future is going to look a little bit like the past or you'll just be paralyzed um there's no reason that they won't work as well for a retiree as they will for an accumulator uh, they should be equally suited to both the real trick in both circumstances or both cases is that you right size the risk to you and that's why we have the fine tuning tables on the merriman website where we show you if you have a different amount allocated to equities and bonds that you historically going back to 19 the 1970s would have seen different rides you know a bumpier ride a smoother ride and so ideally somebody can look at that table and kind of scan down and look at the what the balance would have done with accumulation or just with a fixed balance uh, or a lump sum and develop a feel for which one is a good fit for them. And I think for a retiree, those tools are really, really helpful because especially in your early years of retirement, we were, we were, those are like our biggest nervous Nelly years as an investor. It was approaching retirement and in the first years of retirement. And we really wanted less volatility then and we managed our portfolio um, in a way that gave us that. Okay, next question. Would, uh, would you factor the portfolio manager changes in identifying the best in class position over time? I'm sorry, would, would I what? Okay. Would, uh, it's, it's talking about the portfolio uh, portfolio manager changes, okay, o over time. So are you going to uh, 
um, factor that yin? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, um, the short answer is I, yes, but not very much. And, and the reason is that we try to pick funds that are very systematically managed. So in a sense, I, it, to me, that actually matters more than whether it's labeled and formally called an index fund. Index funds are actually actively managed funds. Look at what's happening to the NASDAQ this weekend. They're reconstituting the allocation they have to various com companies. So behind the scenes, they are actively making decisions about what that fund's allocations should include. It's it's a committee-based decision, but somebody behind the scenes is dialing knobs and changing things. And those are going to change its exposure to these market attributes that drive returns. If you take a fund like uh, an Avantis fund that is called an active fund, but you look at its historical performance, its exposure to these attributes and factors is very, very stable over time because it's managed in a systematic way. So if the fund manager assigned to that fund changed, I wouldn't expect the performance to change very much because the methodology of the fund is so automated. But um, I would still look at it. I would still consider it, but I wouldn't expect it to make much of a change uh, because the funds we pick are very, very close to automatic in what they do. Okay, um, he has another question. Um, he has multiple accounts. They are either they are taxable, tax deferred, and tax free. So will you, uh, would, would you apply a strategy to each individual account or across all accounts? We didn't talk today about uh, account location and asset location, where to put different kinds of assets in your accounts. But that's that's a, a whole topic and presentation unto itself. Uh, you know, in general, I would prefer to have my bonds in a tax deferred account because they spin off uh, income. You know, in the in the 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 payments that are regularly received, the interest payments. I would prefer to have my REITs in tax deferred accounts because they spin off taxable income. Um, I'd prefer to have. Uh, anything spinning off a large dividend to be in my tax deferred accounts. Uh, so there, you know, there are a number of things. There's, there's even decisions you can make about where you want to have your international versus your U.S. funds. Anybody interested in that, in a detailed discussion of that, I think I would look at Larry Swedro's Your Complete Guide to Retirement Planning book. I think that's the title. Um, it's yeah, he has a whole chapter where he talks about account location in, in some detail and tax efficiency. And I think that's a great reference for that. OK, what is the website for fun factor regression analysis? It's uh, portfoliovisualizer.com. And that's where I get all of my data. I have to then build my analysis on my own. So I have to build a spreadsheet and you would too, or just do the simple math like I did on the slides. So it's not, it's not rocket science. It's not super very, it's not really very difficult, but um, portfolio visualizer, all one word.com. It's run by uh, Ilya Lapanainen, I believe, um, if I remember the name right, really great guy, fantastic resource. Also a really good resource for taking your own portfolio and back testing it if you want to see how it would have done or doing Monte Carlo simulations on it or uh, doing financial planning scenarios. It's 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 a really fantastic resource. OK, um, this person said we are 65 years old. Is uh, tilting still appropriate for us? Is what still appropriate? Um, tilting, I guess you, you mentioned about uh, how the fund uh, tilted to one side. Versus oh, tilting. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. So that was one of the things that one of the reasons I included safe withdrawal rate throughout the presentation is that it, if you're a retiree, one of the biggest decisions you make is how much to spend every year. 
out of your portfolio. And the higher a safe withdrawal rate your portfolio can withstand, the less likely you are to run out of money. Um, and so, uh, and the more likely you are to leave a legacy. And what we saw as we went through the presentation is that when we added small cap value to a total market or S&P 500 kind of allocation, it improved the safe withdrawal rates. So for a retiree, I think I would definitely include tilting towards small or tilting towards value or tilting towards small and value. Uh, and we didn't talk about it in the presentation in the interest of time, but all of the strategies that I mentioned could also be diversified internationally. So, you you know, we I modeled it just really simply to keep it easy with a U.S. small cap value fund. But you could split it between a U.S. small cap value and an international small cap value fund to buy yourself a little bit more geographic diversification. Uh, so. You know, there's that's one of the reasons there's books and and websites there's a lot more we could talk about okay um the next question uh some small cap value funds they will not include the race some international funds they don't include certain countries such as south korea do you take this in um into account when select the best in class funds? Did, did you say small cap value funds don't include REITs? He says some, it's not all of them. Oh, yeah, some. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we would normally look for REITs as a separate fund. Um, and so in our 10 fund, ultimate buy and hold, REITs are something different. I do take into account though, uh, in the selection of my funds, how broadly diversified they are across geographies and uh, in general look for funds that are very broadly diversified. Uh, you would expect though that the uh, emerging markets, for example, small and emerging markets value would not be inside a typical international developed small cap value fund. And so when you look at the table of recommended funds, we have different recommendation for international developed from emerging markets. And, and the, we just, we try to find funds that fit the role or the description of, of that um, asset class the best possible. Yeah. Okay, um, next question. How important is rebalancing into current best in class? on an annual basis, how frequent uh, do the best in class fund changes? Have you modeled that uh, rebalancing versus the buy and hold of current best in class? I haven't modeled that. Well, sometimes in the past, I have looked at how our new best in class recommendations would have done compared to the old best in class recommendations or to an all vanguard set of recommendations and one of the really important things to realize is that the difference between funds within a category is far less important than the difference in your overall asset allocation so whether you have 10 or 20 percent in small cap value in your portfolio is far more important than whether you have fund a or b for small cap value in your portfolio and because those differences can be small i always emphasize when i come up with my updates which are done every two years roughly to the to the best in class recommendations I always emphasize that you should really think carefully about the tax consequences of the change because it makes no sense at all to pay a huge tax bill to move from a fund that has uh, you know a, an expected return of 8.2% to one that has an expected return of 8.3%. It's going to take you 100 years to get back the huge tax bill you would have paid. And since everybody's situation is different, I unfortunately that has to be left as a study to the interested student, so to speak. But um, but it is really important to do that analysis. And uh, you know, I have I have some 
funds in my investments that are still from our best in class recommendations of five years ago because I, I they're in a taxable account and I just didn't want to pay the profit, uh, the tax on the profit to change them. But my funds in my tax deferred accounts are almost all switched. So it, you know, you have to you have to be tax wise in making that decision. That's good. Yeah. Okay. What was the four groups for the WW four funds? I think we mentioned that, right? Large I did, yeah. The four yeah. assets in the worldwide four fund were US large cap blend or S P five hundred, US small cap value international large cap value and international small cap blend and 25 percent to each of those uh it one of the nice things about that portfolio is that it's a lot there's much bigger selection of u.s small cap value funds than there are international small cap value funds so you're you're picking and you still get the s p 500 which a lot of people will hear about in the news so you still got exposure to that uh, and then you get the large cap value internationally where there's a fair number of funds to choose from and small cap blend internationally where there's a fair number of funds to choose from. So it's it's a very pragmatic and practical approach. Okay. What do you think mid cap funds? Uh, I think mid cap funds are between uh, large and small. Uh, if, if you look at it, the analysis that I had up at the front of the chart, it actually says that mid caps are not a bad place to be. And if you look at our best in class recommendations, our large cap value fund actually tilts a little towards mid. Um, so, you know, if you go with mid, it pushes you a little bit more in the direction of small in value. One of the arguments, one of the academic arguments of why smaller companies have greater range of returns. I don't know if you remember, but on the small end of the spectrum on that chart way up at the beginning, small growth was horrible and small value was great. Yeah. And part of the reason for that, uh, academics believe, is that it's the it, the dispersion comes from the number. You just have way, way, way more companies there. So it's hard for analysts to follow them in detail. And that means it's easier for them to be mispriced and it's easier for uh, value opportunities to exist that then drive premiums and future returns. And that argument would hold true to some extent for mid caps in the same way it does for small. Um, and definitely more for mid and small than it does for large, because the large funds are all just, you know, analyzed to death. Yeah. Right, right. Hey, Stephanie? Yes. Yeah, this is Dave. Hey, uh, there's so many questions here. I know. And something that we could probably do is we could go on forever. One thing I would, I would like to ask all the attendees to think about is those of us who are part of the AAII, and we discuss these on a regular basis. There's discussions, there's publications, and there's ways to become educated and knowledgeable. Chris has done a wonderful job today. I'd like to thank him for what he's been doing and, and help everybody understand the basics. If you can, you know, obviously you need to be part of, I think, you know, what they try to do. And then think about what we try to do at the AAI by having webinars like this to hopefully educate and keep make people knowledgeable about the process. If you think a two hour session with Chris is going to solve all your financial questions, that's probably not a, an accurate idea. So I would just, as a, as a member of AAI, I'd say, hey, join us. And a lot of these, these webinars are free. And uh, so just think about that for your future. Sorry for the public, the uh, editorial, but, uh, or the commercial, but thank you. Thank no, you, Chris. No yeah, no problem. And you know, Paul and I in the past have often taken some of the questions we didn't get to and spoken to them on our sound investing podcast too. so we we may we may do that. So uh, after the after this meeting is over, feel free to go to our podcast and listen in, and maybe your question will get answered there too. Yeah, so this question is kind of interesting. Why do you say? the worst drawdown are in early retirement. Yeah, so it, it, when I do the modeling and I go back and I, 
I, uh, I model these experiences that begin on the 1,000, 1,100 plus months. Uh, you, can, you can see each one is an individual life experience, so to speak. And somewhere along the way, uh, the drawdown is going to be the worst uh, for each and every one of those life experiences. And what we see when we, we model like a target date fund is that the greatest volatility and the worst drawdown somebody had to tolerate usually happens in their 40s. It's around 42, age 42. And that's because you have a, a very large balance in your account and the contributions you're making with dollar cost averaging are starting to become small compared to the size of the account. So those two things mean that the years when you are most likely to see the balance in your account decline as part of your lifetime experience were around 42. Now, if you take an all equity strategy, in the early years, you have low volatility because you're doing the dollar cost averaging, but then you ramp up to this high volatility and it never declines. In fact, it gets worse early in retirement because you're starting to take money out. So um, that's that's why, yep. Okay, um, maybe this will be the last question. Um, how does a bond ledger strategy compare to a straight percentage of stock versus bond when it comes to sequence of return risk? Well, a bond, a bond ladder strategy uh, this is where you would buy um, a batch of bonds with one duration and then a little later buy a batch of bonds with a different, uh, uh, you know, same duration. And, and so you end up with a bunch of overlapping bond periods. Uh, I haven't modeled how that differs from just buying, for example, a, a, an ETF or a mutual fund that gives you exposure to similar bonds. I wouldn't think it's very different, but um, it, it's only the bond part of the strategy. So a bond ladder is 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 just bonds. It's not. There's no equities in a bond ladder, uh, and um, I would think that it could substitute for the bond part of the strategies that we looked at today, like the bond part of the allocation in a target date fund. Um, in general, though, I I think of bond ladders as more complex than most investors need because most most investors will probably do fine with just an ETF mutual fund or target date fund um, to get their bond allocation. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We have so many questions. We couldn't get all of them answered by Chris. I Chris. probably talked too long, but I really <laughs> appreciate the questions and I appreciate the audience. Thanks for, for tuning in. Yeah, I know we, we was getting a lot of good questions. Um, thank you, Chris, for very good presentations. And, oh, my pleasure. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure we will ask you to come back in the future. <laughs> sure, I always, <laughs> I always learn something. Uh, it's, it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we was in the, the meeting now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending the meetings. Bye.